everybody, how you doing? My name's Dave, and if you like funk music, you can call me Davey Poo, the mobile music minstrel. Hey, how's it going? So today, we're going to do something a little bit different than what we've done before. Today, we're going to dissect a funk groove, and I'm going to talk about all the different elements and how they work together and how to build your very own funk groove. I'm going to use a song that was on the latest release I was part of. So if you're on the Audio Bus Forum, or you're on Facebook and follow me, or you follow Doug Woods from the Sound Test Room, you probably got bludgeoned with a whole bunch of ads saying, hey, we just released a new album. Well, that is very much true. Doug Woods and Colin Powell and myself made an album called Lily's Gone Mad, and it was a total blast. And I first, before we do anything, I want to say thank you so much, Doug and Colin, for asking me to be a part of it, for including me in this. I really hope I didn't muck up the works. The two of those guys have got such a great thing going on. I wanted to compliment it, and I didn't want to screw it all up. So I had a total blast making this record. I haven't had this much fun in ages. Thanks, guys. I hope my contributions were cool. I'd love to do another one whenever you're ready. Let's talk about Funk Groove. So the idea for the album was an idea that Doug had, and he wanted to call the project Lily's Gone Mad, and he had this idea of this girl who's slowly going mad or going crazy. He had the first bunch of songs that he gave to Colin and I, and we added our parts, and then we kind of contributed our own tunes as we went on. And this was a tune that I contributed. In one of the songs on the album called Lily Takes a Train, Doug had used a sample of a little train whistle blowing. And I was using a lot of samples for this record to add atmosphere and to create a presence, an environment that each of these songs would set in so that it could help tell the story. And I was having a lot of fun with the samples. I had this idea of taking sound of a train and having it start chugging along, you know, like an old steam train. And I figured that once I got it up to the tempo that I wanted, I could loop it and have it start a beat. And I thought it would be a cool way to sort of transition into a tune and create a long introduction. Okay, so here is Q Basis. And I used this to, to track everything. And Doug and Colin and I passed back uh, Cubase's files and just WAV files to get this done. So you'll see here on track nine is the train sample. Now it started out with uh, steam blowing, so I kind of faded it in. So that it wouldn't be so abrasively uh, abrasive a start. And you'll see here, you'll hear the chugging of the train. Now, I actually took this sample into Aurea, and I had it detect all the transients. And then I, you know, I, I forwarded the sample up to a point where the chugging of the train was roughly equivalent to the tempo that I wanted for the song. And then I snipped out a bit of it and I did a transient uh, detection so I could get all the hits. Chum, 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 chum. And then I sliced it up and I quantized it so that it would match the tempo of what I wanted. So here, here, we're still speeding up. Now, when you hear the quantized sample by itself, it's gonna sound a little choppy and I hear, you could hear the edits. It's not super smooth. So what I did was, when I got to the point where I knew I was going to start quantizing the, the sample, I started adding in other things on top of it that were at the same tempo, so it kind of masked the edits and the, and the jumpiness of it. So I'll back up here. Um, first I started with this sample that I had that was a drum loop. And you can hear it getting up to speed any day now. And so then when it got to tempo, and you can already hear, now your attention is on this new rhythm and not necessarily the train sample. And then, I'll back this up just a hair, I started adding in other samples. Here's a conga. Okay. And then I added in a fast conga and then a shaker. So this was the rhythm that I built up from these samples, and this is what kind of gave me the idea to go funk with this. It wasn't the intention initially, it's just I kind of got here, and I was like, well, what kind of a beat can I add to this? And that just, and then all of a sudden I was like, well, now I'm in funk territory. So let me back this up. Here's a couple of manipulations that I did to make these samples interesting. So I had this conga sample here. Oops. Oh. 
kind of a standard standard Latin y kind of generic sample. But I thought that doing that with the train, it was like a little too much by itself. And I really liked this, this kind of thing, the pots and pans. So I pan them a little bit this way to separate them a bit. But this sounded a little too busy for me to start. So I actually took the conga sample and I slowed it down to half the tempo and I got this. Which I thought was really interesting and it worked really well with this. It didn't immediately make it too busy. And I could add a shaker in. And then I could add back in the conga at twice its, at, at its normal speed. And now I've got a really interesting, really complex rhythm going made out of the samples. Sorry about that. So now I've got a really interesting, complex kind of a sample thing going here. So eventually I had to fade out the train. So you can see here that I faded out the train and I went just down to the rhythm tracks. This is after I've already introduced the drum beat because now with the train, there's so much sound in the background, it started to get cluttered. So let me back this back up again. I'm going to add back in the drums and the train. So here's how we started the group. And the slow conga comes in and that's dead center. Now the train and the slow conga are dead center because I know I'm going to drop those out. The pots and pans are over in my left ear and in the camera you're probably seeing my right ear. And then I've got in the other ear the, um, the regular speed conga. And when I drop the four on the floor disco beat, that's when everything sort of gels together and now it becomes a groove that you can wrap your, your butt around. Okay, and then I, I faded out the train and then I eventually faded out the slow conga as well. So now I've got the beat, I got the shaker, I have the pots and pans, and I have the conga. And as the track went on, I started to bring those percussion elements out as other instruments were introduced. Okay. So now let's back up. Okay, so that's how I built the basic groove. Now let's talk about how we make how we make a funk groove and make it make sense. The place that I got the most information and learned the absolute most about how to construct a funk groove was a book called The Funk Masters, The Great James Brown Rhythm Sections, and I'll put a link to it below and I'll put a little picture in. Funk Masters was an awesome book, and it broke down not only like just one instrument, but it broke down the whole rhythm section and it mapped it out on a musical score. So you could see the drum beat, the bass line, and usually the two different, usually there's two different guitar players playing these grooves. And so it would show you the drum part, it would show you the bass part, it would show you the individual guitar parts, and then it would show you them all together because it's the syncopation of the groove here and that's key to funk music. What I mean by syncopation is that not every instrument plays at the same time on the same beat. I always imagine that they fit together like this, okay? All the instruments complement each other, but they don't always play the same thing. There are multiple ways of approaching this. This is just one way of approaching it, but I'm gonna talk through my ideas and sort of how I arrived at where I arrived. When I start a funk groove, a lot of the time I start with the simple four on the floor drum beat. The reason I do that is because it leaves a lot of room open for the other instruments to create that sense of syncopation, okay? Nothing going on here but a kick drum, a snare drum, and one open hi-hat. And it's literally that through the whole tune. I, there's no, there's, I think, crash cymbal at the very end or maybe once in the track. There's no fills. Um, it wasn't always deliberate, but it, it it's a, like a blank slate, okay? And it instantly gives you the pumping dance-ness of it, you know, that butt-shaking, shoulder-shaking thing with, with this beat, and it's driving, but it leaves the rhythm open to be whatever you want it to be. Now, I purposely wanted to do something with, um, 
with guitars. I've been listening lately to a lot of Chromio. And the new Chromio album called Head Over Heels is a great album. And they do this kind of thing a lot. It's a very sort of Prince idea. Again, uh, but principles going all the way back to the godfather of soul, Mr. James Brown himself. I'm taking this idea of not everything playing at the same time. I'm going to go forward a little into the groove because this is where everything is actually playing at the same time. Okay. So, here is the first guitar part. You notice that it comes in on the three. One, two, three. One, two. One, two. One, two. One, two. By leaving that gap at the top of the measure, you give room for the other instruments to make themselves known. So, that's one guitar part. Here's the other guitar part, and you're gonna notice that these are kind of a call and response. Okay, so let's start here. So, you've got... Oh, that's the breakdown. Okay, so you've got one part is playing chords. That's just a standard nine chord on guitar. You just bar the last three strings at any given fret on the guitar. It's like the world's most classic funk chord. Okay, loose wrist strumming. With that face, too. Um, you'll notice that the chordal part comes in on the three, but the, the single note line, the muted, palm muted guitar part, that comes in on the two. Again, done on purpose so that you've got a sort of call and response. And the kick drum, one. So you've got one, and then kick. Guitar, kick, guitar one, guitar two, kick, guitar one, guitar two, right? And they all sit like this. James Brown's guitar players usually had one guy playing chords and one guy playing a single note line. And again, they contrast against each other. So I'm using that same idea here. Now, each part by itself is very listenable. Okay, the second part also is a melody of its own. It dances. It's kind of a dance, you know, it's, it's kind of dancing around while the drums are just keeping that four on the floor going. And the, the other guitar is just one, two, three. One, two, three. This part is providing a little bit of movement, a little bit of dance. Okay. So this is how I designed the guitar parts for the first section. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna enter the bass. So the synth bass is what is what's the main thing here. So now you're going to notice that the bass happens on the one. One, two, three. In fact, it anticipates the one a little bit. Another thing that's key here is that you'll notice the bass also leaves tons of space. The bass leaves space for the uh, for the guitars to be heard. So the staccato or short or sharp nature of all of these parts really works so that you can hear everything together. So let me play all of them for you at the same time. And you're going to hear that you get bass, then get then guitar one, then guitar two, and they all call and response each other. So. So here it goes. Bass, guitar one, guitar two. Okay, and there I added in a slap bass. So here I have a live bass and a synth bass. 
This is another trick that Prince used to do. Did it a lot with Morris Day and the Time. They had a guy playing synth bass and a live bass player, and they would play the same thing, and it, it really thickened up the bottom end. So I'm not a great slap bass player, but I wanted to have that element in here, and I thought that if I slapped bass through the entire track, it would just be too much. So this way, you get a little taste of it, and I always liked having the audience want more. I always liked leaving them wanting more. You know, you, the coolest part of the song, you only do it once. So that way they're like, oh, oh, they have to go back and listen to the song again for the cool part. You know, you don't want to overdo it or wear out the welcome. So I'm going to show you here. Okay. That's the synth bass. And there's the live bass. Now, I actually performed the entire thing live like the whole track and you can see if i if i drag this out you'll see there's much more bass but not all the fills were very good and i thought this didn't have the tightness that i wanted if you'll notice that the bass is so much tighter because the note cuts right off and i wasn't able to achieve that with the live bass so i just used the live bass for the fills to give it a little extra oomph so here you go. We got all the percussion elements. And so let's go back and talk about how we got into this. Stay tuned all the way to the end of the video, ladies and gentlemen, because I have a special gift for you. So keep listening. Okay, so here you go. Here you're hearing us, hearing me build up the track, building in, adding in all the percussion elements on top of the train to create this kind of groove. And now that I've established the drums, I start pulling out the train. The train blurs everything too much. And in order to make this groove really work, everything's got to be sharp and tight and super syncopated and nice and staccato. There's one guitar. Okay, slowly letting in, letting the audience in on the groove. But I'm not putting the whole thing out there. We're just doing a slow ramp up to, again, keep this feeling of motion going, like we're building you to something. We haven't arrived there yet. We're getting there. Okay, so that's key. Another element of funk music and of, of lots of types of dance music is dropping stuff out. I love dropping out the drums because all of a sudden it wakes up the audience and makes them really pay attention. And live if you can do a really good drop, people lose their f***ing minds when you do a drop live. So if you can time it well and you don't, again, don't do it too many times. Don't do overkill, but just enough. So to get us into the main groove before we introduce the bass, just guitars, got a cool groove going. Now when the bass comes in, it's so much more effective. And you'll notice that I keep the shaker going until about halfway through that break when the shaker drops out and then all you hear are the guitars. Okay, gets you into the tune. All right. Now that I've kind of explained the ideology here, I'm going to go quickly through these so that I can wrap the other parts up. So I wanted to add a couple more sections because I didn't just want it to be the same groove all the way out through the end of the tune. So here's the bridge part. Okay, I went with a complementary bass parts. They don't play exactly the same thing. Uh, so the synth bass is going is skipping that beat. Okay. And then the bass is not playing. And I didn't want to do just straight boom, bap, boom, bap, boom, bap, boom, bap, boom, bap. It just seemed, again, too obvious. It's like the obvious disco thing to do. So we kind of tip our hat to that, but maybe don't play the obvious thing. Okay. Um, for the guitar parts here... So again, more call and response. So I've got one. The guitar part that's in your left ear is gonna start on the three. 
and the other one's gonna start on the one, so that they get this kind of overlap, but they're not playing at the same time. Now, while the bass is going, they provide a little bit of back and forth, and because they're panned, you get a little dance through the stereo spectrum. With the groove in there, the drums. Okay, now you, the groove, like the style of the groove changes a bit. So it shakes up the feel and it propels the song forward. So now we go to straight bass. Forward on the floor bass. Driving, pushing the song forward, okay? And I left that live bass in all the time to help propel this forward until we get to the next part. And now I'm back to having big gaps in the bass line. Okay, whereas the bridge was very busy, now we're back to having big gaps. We also have a similar part to the first one. We're similar to this. Right? It's similar. Go here. But again, it's a tweaked just a little bit to provide a different flavor. And I added some different guitar parts so that it would stand out. The first thing I did was I did this very Memphis-y kind of uh, Stax Studios, Atlantic Soul kind of a groove. Like the Booker T and the MGs guys, Steve Cropper, used to do this kind of double stop on a guitar, uh, kind of a descending line. All right, so let's get out of the... There it is. So I want to do something with a little more melody. And, and again, contrasting all the sharp, biting chords of the first part, this now has a, a lyrical quality to it that's a little different. I also wanted to keep this idea of a chordal part and a single note part, so I added in... Oh, that's the B part. That's the bridge. So again, I tried to do a response. One. The second guitar comes in on the two. It doesn't come in on the one with the first guitar. And since the bass leaves a lot of space... I had the guitars step forward when the bass steps back. And again, everything complements each other. Okay, so to back up to the top of this part... Oops. And you'll notice, by this point in the song, I've dropped out the conga, and I've dropped out the pots and pans banging. I only have the shaker and the drums. Again, I've gotten rid of some of the clutter in the groove so that you can hear all the individual parts and they complement each other. Also, I didn't want to fill up the whole song. I wanted Colin to add stuff, I wanted Doug to add stuff, and I need to leave room for them to, to add their parts while still providing structure. So this was a little fuller than some of the other tunes I gave to them, but you know, wanted to give them options, challenge them in new and exciting ways, and not always give them the same thing to work with. Same groove, same style of music, same arrangement. You know, we gotta shake it up. Okay, so here's the last part of the song. We got to this low um, groove with the bass, where the, the synth bass is holding these long notes. Again, big gaps. Space. You can't be afraid to leave space. Nobody can play 100% of the time, and no band is interesting that has everybody playing all of the time. You gotta leave gaps. Your, your music has to ebb and flow and push and pull in different ways. So you can't just have a single track playing the entire song. Subtractive mixing is super key. You can lay in all your parts, but when you go to mix the tune, pull out some stuff. You don't need everything all the time. It's more effective when you have, we give each of those parts a chance to speak. Okay, so we got these long notes. And I only added in the live bass for the fills at the end of each four bar phrase. Okay, so give it a little bite. 
but let the synth run it out. So, again, sticking with this chordal part, single note part combination, the chordal part here I ripped straight out of James Brown's Papa's Got a Brand New Bag. It is nearly identical to that. Check it out. Now cut off the end to make it nice and sharp and punchy, but with the bass being held and the guitar kind of not playing legato, but strumming and letting it ring out, they complement each other really well. Because the guitar part bleeds over the bar line and only one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four. And it stops at the beginning of the fourth measure. So you have this sort of over the bar line guitar part. And I wanted something else. Now I talked earlier about having the guitar part sort of have this dancing idea like it dances through the arrangement. That was kind of what I thought here. I wanted a guitar part that was non-linear and not necessarily repeated. And I, I hit on this on a lark and I just played it. I did it in one take. It just, it all fell out of me. Those are the best takes. It's kind of like just dancing down a scale. It works really well with this part because you've got one being held out, another one's kind of dancing around. And because the bass line is long legato notes with space, you really get to hear the dancing. So let's go back to the beginning of that with the drums in there. Now you'll hear I dropped out the snare drum so I could break down the song. You know, we go from this into a nice little breakdown. Kind of brings the vibe down, but it keeps the intensity. You know, that, you know, it keeps a level of intensity there, as does the little dancey guitar part. Now the drums come back in to pick it up for the ending. So that's pretty much it. I mean, this is the kind of thing that I do. This is the way that I think when I'm building a funk groove. I really like complementary parts, parts that play off of the other instruments and don't always play exactly what the other instruments are playing. Um, it's more of a challenge to make them work, but when you can get it to work, it works really, really well. Some bands that you should check out that do really good syncopated funk, definitely check out James Brown. His stuff from the 70s is really where it's at. Early 70s to mid 70s is really the But you know, I think about 67, 68 is when he started really hitting on the funk. So definitely James Brown, Sly and the Family Stones, another excellent band. There's a million of them, but for syncopated grooves, Tower of Power is the one you really want to listen to. These guys have mastered the art of not playing on the downbeat and not playing on the beat, but playing on all the offbeats. And they have, you know, a six or seven piece horn section, a guitar, bass, keyboard player, drums, percussion. They're a huge band. It's, you know, 15 guys on stage or something silly like that. And yet they're making this monstrously tight, ridiculously syncopated funk with all of these parts that are complementary. It's very, very hard to do. Really recommend you check out like Back to Oakland, Tower of Power, you know, the tune What is Hip. There's a million of them. Go check them out. I'll make some suggestions in the uh, pictures and in the text below. If you were patient and waited all the way through this video, I have five promotional codes for Lily's Gone Mad. If you want the whole album, you got to comment below. The first five comments that say, I want Lily's Gone Mad, we'll find a way to send you a code so that you can have Lily's Gone Mad. So comment below, like the video, subscribe to the channel. Thanks so much for all your guys' feedback. Thank you so much, Doug Woods, and thank you so much, Colin Powell. I'm just so happy to be a part of this, and I can't wait for the next one. I will leave you guys with a little funkness. See you next time. Funk on, brethren. <laughs>